Welcome to everyone who is signing on. My name is Dr. Amy Kropel, and I am the director of the UF Center for European Studies. Um, our center is a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, as well as a Title VI National Resource Center for Europe. Uh, the center is housed in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and is a multidisciplinary area and language studies center. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's presentation and discussion are recorded and will be available on the UFCES website. We will have a Q&A session following presentation and we encourage participants to submit questions using the Q&A button and not the chat window if you can. So again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today to discuss Making Data's Natural Home, Geographies of Digital Development in Europe's new Node Poll. This talk is the first lunchtime symposium of the fall semester. Generally, CES hosts three to four lunchtime symposiums per semester for faculty and advanced graduate students to present current research on Europe from any discipline. And if you have a European topic you'd like to present, please contact us. You can contact myself or Carla Ruffer. Uh, our emails are on the CES website. In addition to the lunchtime symposium, our center also offers a number of funding opportunities for both faculty and students such as summer travel grants, a working group conference grant, course development enhancement grants, and more. And for that reason as well, we encourage you to check out our website, ces.ufl.edu. Our speaker today is Alex Johnson. Alex Johnson. We're very happy to welcome Dr. Johnson to this forum, but also to UF as a new faculty member or relatively new faculty member. She is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Florida, and her research takes digital infrastructure as a lens on questions of sovereignty, emerging spatial politics, and enduring formations of imperial power, especially in Iceland and the broader Arctic. Her work has appeared most recently in American Anthropologist and will be forthcoming in a book entitled Data Fixation, Infrastructure and Industry, Where Cloud Touches Ground. And we're very fortunate that today moderating our Q&A session is Dr. Brenda Chalfin, Dr. Chalfin is the director of UF Center for African Studies, which is also a Title VI uh, area studies program. She's also a professor of anthropology. Her research interests include anthropology of the state, inter international commerce, commodities, globalization, bureaucracy, and borders. At the end of the event, as you try to leave, you will be taken to a very brief survey, and we ask that you take a few moments to complete it so that we can continue to improve and provide valuable programs. And with that, I'd like to hand the discussion over to Dr. Johnson, and I will myself mute and get off screen to avoid any distractions. Alex, the ball's in your court. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Amy, so much for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. I'm really looking forward to sharing some work with the Center for European Studies, and I'm especially looking forward to being in conversation, first with Brenda and then all of you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and do the thing that everyone does where it takes a second um, and then ask you to confirm that you can see what I'm showing you. We yes, can. I can see it. Fantastic. Okay, thank you all. Um, okay, so um, today I'm going to present a piece of research that forms a part of a now eight year long ethnographic project about the relationship between data and place. And I got interested in this relationship between data and place precisely because of the ways that it tends to get erased in our dominant discourse. The cloud, for example, conjures an image of diffuse ephemerality, a sense that our data is everywhere and nowhere at once. And it's, as it's become possible to store and process data at a distance, computation has become distributed. Rather than taking place on servers inside our homes and offices, it gets outsourced to data centers cited around the world. To appreciate this, we need only ask ourselves where the last music we streamed on Spotify came from, or where the last document we saved to Dropbox went. But just because the location of our data isn't obvious doesn't mean that it's unknowable or immaterial. In asking where all of this data is going, I found that more and more of it is headed north toward the Nordic countries and particularly Iceland where data storage is a rapidly growing industry. So in the broader project, I ask what draws data centers to this location how they are made to fit into social and material landscapes here, and what kind of impacts this process has had 
for both Icelanders and digital infrastructures. I explore the ways that data storage in Iceland gets entangled with natural environments, national identities, and post-colonial politics. And in today's talk, I'll focus primarily on the first of those three terms. Today, I wanna to think about the ways that storing digital data is being framed as a natural fit in Iceland, asking how this discourse works, what it achieves, and what it obscures. Then I'll complicate this narrative by briefly turning to some of the other and more ambivalent ways that data gets anchored on the island, including histories of military occupation and corporate extraction. Throughout, I'll make a case for paying attention to digital data's situated materiality, or the ways that local landscapes shape digital networks and are reshaped by them in turn. And I'll say that today, um, what I'm trying to do is offering a kind of broad overview of a place and an industry and a set of processes that I know not everyone is intimately familiar with. And so I'm going to jump around a little bit between field sites, between projects, between interlocutors. Um, I'm hoping that that winds up to be being coherent, but I'm happy to delve deeper into any of these in the Q&A. Okay, data's environments. In 2015, midway through my research on expanding data storage infrastructures in Iceland, I traveled to a conference called World Hosting Days, the self-described world's most important event for the hosting and cloud services industry. Held that year in an off-season amusement park in Germany, the conference boasted both an impressive lineup of speakers and a bustling exhibitor hall, which as you see here is where sales representatives showcased their wares. The products of the so-called cloud services industry, which was valued at $50 billion last year, are numerous, ranging from servers to software, cooling systems to security services. But it is not only companies jostling for market share, it's also countries trying to sell themselves as data center sites and benefit from the land leases, power contracts, and bandwidth sales that these facilities can bring along. The Iceland booth pictured here is one such example. Designed by a state company called Invest in Iceland, which generously invited me along that year, the booth makes the rounds through trade shows like this one, hoping to attract potential investors. And Iceland is far from alone in this project. During my weekend at the conference, I visited booths by Luxembourg, Germany, the Netherlands, and more. But what set the Iceland booth apart at World Hosting Days, and you can see in this photo how it stands out from the pack, is the way it emphasizes Iceland's environment. Swathed in the colors of Aurora Borealis and featuring on its other side high resolution images of snowy mountains and stunning waterfalls, the Iceland booth leans into Iceland's natural assets. And it works. Over the course of that weekend, I watched his head swiveled toward it, drawn in by the maximalist aesthetic in an otherwise anodyne conference hall. Over the course of my broader research, I've watched as large data centers have proliferated in Iceland, with one going up at the start of my fieldwork and eight more operational by its end. To make sense of this convincing link between data and Iceland's environment, I wanna start by saying a little bit more about what data centers are and do. So a data center, also known colloquially as a server farm, is simply a place where multiple and sometimes many computer servers are run at once. But beyond that baseline definition, data center becomes a flexible category. A data center can be an in-house operation, for example, containing the data of Google or a branch of American government, or it can be a co-location center where multiple clients lease space and infrastructure. A data center can be a server room in a corporate basement, or it can be the China mobile facility in Hong Kong, currently the largest data center in the world, clocking in at 7.7 .7 million square feet. And while most data centers look like nondescript warehouses, segmented by racks on which servers are stacked, innovative designs range from experiments with underwater storage to speculation over shooting data centers into space. However, across all that variation, what virtually all data centers have in common is that they consume enormous amounts of electricity and can produce enormous amounts of heat. So all computational processing generates heat as a byproduct. And this is the same heat that you would feel on your legs if you leave your laptop running there too long. 
When too much heat is generated, computers run inefficiently, more and eventually they burn themselves out. Preventing thermal disaster then becomes a non-trivial issue in a data hall containing hundreds or thousands of servers snugly arranged on dozens of racks. Power then used both to fuel servers directly and to keep them sufficiently cool is essential for data centers to function. Power, as one developer I interviewed put it, is the driver in the data center game. In fact, data storage is one of the most energy intensive industries operating today. Commercial data centers routinely report electricity consumption, roughly equivalent to that of small towns. In 2015, data centers consumed 416 terawatt hours, or roughly 3% of all power generated worldwide. Or as the NGO Greenpeace put it, if the cloud were a country, its energy consumption would be the fifth largest in the world. These significant impacts have become a focus of a wide range of scholarship, insisting that we turn our attention to data's very real materialities. And as computation has emerged as a significant contributor to anthropogenic climate change, energy consumption has also become a pressing issue for the data storage industry, not only as an outsized operational expenditure, but also as a public image problem. Effectively shamed by env environmental scholarship and reporting, many of the major tech companies have now declared their commitment to reducing their carbon footprints. And in the search for a way forward, more and more of them are turning north. Because as it turns out, if the temperature around a data center is colder, the energy required to pool those servers is also reduced. This realization has resulting in emerging concentrations of data storage in cold places. So in 2013, Facebook built a data center in Sweden. Google has run a facility in Finland since 2011. And Microsoft announced its plans to build two data centers in Norway in 2018. In addition to the server farms, bad puns have proliferated. The Nordic region is now known in the industry as the node pole. Iceland, with its coastal winds and long winters, seems ideally situated to get into the game. But on top of its cold, which cuts down those air conditioning requirements, Iceland's abundant hydroelectric and geothermal energy, which comprise 73 and 27 percent respectively of electricity on the national grid, so almost 100 percent, make the island an especially appealing locale. Iceland is one of few countries that produces more energy than is or could ever be consumed domestically. And so data centers constructed in Iceland claim not only the cost break of ambient cooling, but also the distinction of being clean and green. Iceland, it would appear, is digital data's natural home. These at least are the associations emphasized in promotional material produced at the contact points between Iceland and industry. In addition to the Iceland booth, take, for example, this still from a video made by Invest in Iceland, the state agency tasked with attracting foreign direct investments. Entitled The Coolest Location for Data Centers, the short film opens with a sweeping pan across a series of iconic Icelandic landscapes, soaring over black lava fields, glacial ice, and lush pasture lands. But when we finally reach the top of a snow-covered mountain, the camera takes us back down and dives into a convincing CGI rendering of a server farm. As we land on a view of servers humming away inside, the closing shot reads, from pure power of nature to your clients. The aesthetics of this visual tour overlap strongly with Iceland's highly successful tourism campaigns, some of which I'm sure you all have seen. But instead of we viewers imagining ourselves into these stunning landscapes, it is our data which we are meant to picture fitting in here. Or take this image from a promotional brochure produced by Landsvirkjun, the Icelandic national power company. Landsvirkjun, which runs 14 hydropower stations, two geothermal plants, and one wind power field, is poised to benefit from long-term electrical contracts with data center developers. And so they too make their case to those developers with reference to the Icelandic environment. In this image, we see Icelandic nature blended even more seamlessly with information infrastructures. Here, the server racks form a feature of the landscape akin to the mossy mountain nearby. 
with only a faint tire track visible between them, gesturing toward the work that went into making this arrangement. This engineered image of symbiotic coexistence calls to mind the words of one British developer who once told me, Iceland is where evolution would put a data center. Finally, and to be clear, I could do this all day, but I think that you all get the points. Here is the landing page for a data center that I will call Arctera, the first commercial scale data center to open in Iceland in 2012. Over an image of rolling hills and plumes of telltale geothermal steam, the data center tells its international clients, we found the best place in the world for high intensity compute right here in Iceland. Using 100% renewable energy, we give you supernatural capacity that doesn't cost the earth. When you're backed by the planet, your potential is limitless. So all of this, um, and again, there is much more of it, is arguably just marketing talk. It is a pitch that is aimed at selling a product, or in this case, a place. But I think that this discourse is still interesting and important, both for what it accomplishes and for what it elides. To the first point, these materials help us appreciate some of the ways that digital data is deeply entangled with landforms and planetary processes. In many ways, Iceland's self-promotional strategy offers a powerful corrective to early ideas of digital immateriality. Far from hovering benignly in the sky, we see here that the cloud is maintained by earthbound energy in Iceland by rushing rivers and tectonic rifts. Furthermore, we get a sense for an emerging geography of digital networks shaped by these requirements. Just like some environments support banana trees and others pine forests, some parts of the world would seem to lend themselves more readily to the needs of digital data than others. We can also discern here a new industrial strategy developed in response to environmental critique. The idea pitched at every scale of this equation, so from Iceland to data centers and from data centers to their clients, is that Iceland offers a unique escape from the issues of data storage and processing today. The fact of Iceland's coolness reduces the need for energy and its renewable grid neutralizes the energy that is consumed. The solution then put forward to the outsized power consumption of cloud computing is not to develop a more critical consciousness around our own data production or consumption. It's not to advocate for industry regulation. Instead, it's to find that corner of the world where data and nature can coexist without cost. This, I think, is an aim that's worth interrogating and one that I'm going to come back to, but just as important as what these promotional materials showcase is all the things that they leave out. As I mentioned before, what's alighted here is human presence, the labor, expertise, engineering, and infrastructure that square the circle between information and environment. Finding and foregrounding these practices and processes complicates the story of Iceland's being a natural place for data to live. So I turn next to some of my ethnographic work in Iceland, investigating not only how data is drawn to the islands, but how it gets materially anchored here. Infrastructural inheritances. So this again is that advertisement for the data center I call Arctera, located in the southwestern region of Reykjanes, which is where most data construction, data center construction in Iceland is concentrated today. And this is what that data center actually looks like. Now we can see that the data center is not divorced from nature. You can note the purple lupina flowers that are lining the road. But what is more immediately evident in this picture is the infrastructure. So we can see the huge generators at the back of the building, ready to spring into action if the energy grid goes down. We can see the fan and filtration system at the top of the building, channeling in that famously cool Icelandic air. We can see the road offering access to the data center and the security fence limiting that access in turn. All these elements, as well as those we can't see, like the fiber optic cables connecting this data center to the world, are as integral to running a data center in Iceland as its environment. And looking more closely into these infrastructures situates data in Iceland differently. Stefan, an engineer employed at Arctera, offered me one way of doing so. Born and raised on the Reykjanes Peninsula and one of few Icelanders that Arctera had hired, Stefan sometimes let me shadow his work at the data center as well as ask him questions off the clock. 
and was generous in expounding more broadly on his experience. One day, as he walked with me through the construction site of his company's latest expansion, Stefan asked me, you know what got us connected in the first place? And he answered, the American military. Stefan was referring to the fact that Arctera was built in the footprint of a former US military base. Active from 1953 to 2006 and pictured here in 1954, the Naval Air Station Keplavik, more often known as NASCAF, was built as a bastion in the North Atlantic, a buffer between the East and West in the Cold War. The base started out as a bare bones air station, but it was quickly expanded to cover over 20,000 acres and host around 4,000 active duty personnel. The base's surveillance functions were essential to the US military, which earned NASCAF the title of the anti-submarine warfare capital of the world. But like so many other bases built during that period, NASCAF also functioned as its own enclosed and self-sustaining community, the kind of place Terry Gillum has called America towns abroad. NASCAF also transformed the region of Reykjanes. The base quickly replaced the fisheries as the major industry on the peninsula, and thousands of Icelanders crossed through the base's armed checkpoints to work in contracting, food service, accounting, and IT. NASCAF, again, like many sites of American military occupation, was always a contentious presence in Iceland, and many on the Reykjanes resented its influence deeply. At the same time, the base became a source of steady paychecks, on which almost everyone on the peninsula relied. This much, at least, I knew already from living on the Reykjanes and spending time with its residents. But Stefan that day was drawing my attention to the ways that NASCAF created infrastructural pathways that would outlast the military occupation itself. Back at the construction site, Stefan gestured expansively around us as he told me that it was NASCAF that transformed the road into Reykjanes from a gravel track into a major highway, a project that was funded by US dollars and executed by Icelandic laborers. It was NASCAF that built up what would become Iceland's international airport, which today allows foreign clients to conveniently drop by. NASCAF paid for the phone line between the Reykjanes and the Reykjavik and hastened already existing plans to build a fiber optic ring around the islands. And it was NASCAF that extended a sizable cable from the electrical grid to supply the peninsula with ample power. More specifically, the US offered a low interest loan to complete a major hydropower project in exchange for the guarantee that a power line would serve the base. It is all these overlapping connections, Stefan told me, that makes the Reykjanes attractive to the data center industry today. Later on, I would sit with one of Stefan's colleagues over coffee and ask him about the influence Stefan had described. Aaron, a British member of Arctera's executive board who lives in Iceland only part-time, affirmed that the data center indeed owed much of its present success to the NASCAF base. But in addition to the infrastructures Stefan had enumerated, Aaron also pointed to the fact that the base had built a quote-unquote secure perimeter and a safe distance from the population nearby. That NASCAF was set off from the nearest town by a major roadway and surrounded by the now defunct security fence has proven appealing to facilities like Arctera, which contain, as Aaron casually estimated, billions of dollars worth of data. If, as we might assume from data centers promotions, a depeopled environment is ideal, it was NASCAF in its operation and then in its closure that did the work of unpopulating this territory. It was not only then the base's connections that mattered, it was its selective disconnections too. So in this image here, the construction that's foregrounded is the NASCAF naval base. Um, the road that runs kind of horizontally across the image is that dividing line. And then way off in the distance, the settlements that you can see along the coastline um, is the place that Icelanders lived and still live. So it's Stefan and Aaron, whose everyday work is caring for data in Iceland, emphasized the long legacy of the NASCAF base in making these efforts possible. This association is perhaps surprising, given the distance between a military occupation and a digital developments. It most certainly is not natural. The NASCAF base made the Reykjanes Peninsula attractive and accessible to digital developments. Not only is infrastructure essential to that legacy, but infrastructure developed for the purpose of serving a foreign occupation and shielding it from local intervention. 
This dynamic, as Stefan would sometimes reflect upon, is echoed in the foreign owned and operated data centers filling out the militarized plateau today. The military history of the Deaconess Peninsula then offers one window into the labor, the built environment, and the lived experiences that anchor the data storage industry in Iceland today. And the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna take up another one, even closer to the question of nature in Iceland and its claiming by the data center industry. So what you see here is Kauranjukurvikun or the Kauranjukur Dam. The body of the right here, of the body of water to the right here used to be Yerkesal Audal, but today is known as the Hauksloan Reserve. The largest of dozens, if not hundreds, of dams in Iceland, Kaurinukur represents another major infrastructure that undergirds the data storage industry, and also another history of lo another local history of foreign influence, because the water that cascades down onto the turbines at this power plant. Generate, generating 4,600 gigawatt hours as they go, does not power the nearby Mullerthing municipality. It goes to the Alcoa aluminum smelter instead. Kaurinukurvikun and its connection to Alcoa offers another entry point into understanding the infrastructure that undergirds data centers in Iceland and the contested history of its development. Iceland, as we've already seen, is celebrated for its energy with a grid comprised almost entirely of renewables, producing five times more electricity than its people need. This abundance is what attracts data centers to Iceland and what enables them to position themselves as clean and green. And yet Iceland's energy machine wasn't made for its own sake. As academics, industry representatives and activists all told me, energy production in Iceland has followed a path of twinned development. It was a power plant for an aluminum plant, Pieter told me simply in the kitchen of his Reykjavik apartment. A historian of science, Pieter's research has been particularly focused on the politics of energy. Of course, he said Icelanders had long dammed rivers and tapped into geothermal streams for their own use, even building out mun robust municipal systems at the turn of the 20th century. But the industry of, en of energy started in 1969 when Rio Tinto, a Canadian corporation, opened an aluminum smelter in Iceland in conjunction with a geothermal power plant nearby. Aluminum smelting is the process of extracting the oxide alumina from bauxite and losing, using electrolysis to turn it into aluminum. Energy intensive and heavily polluting, smelting is an unpopular but profitable industry that would transform the Icelandic economy and energy sector. In 1998, another, this time American smelter, was built in the town of Grundartangi, along with another geothermal power plant. In 2006 came the Alcoa smelter and the controversial Kaurinukur Dam. Today, these three smelters use a whopping 80% of Iceland's energy, but they are equally the reason so much energy is made. Iceland's grid was expanded to serve the needs of heavy industry. In other words, Iceland's exemplary production of green energy is inextricable from its use as an offshore aluminum smelting site. This coupled expansion of power production and power intensive industry is deeply controversial in Iceland. The construction of the Kauranjukur Dam sparked protests where Icelandic and international activists drew attention to the ecological impacts of damming rivers, including the loss of vegetation and displacement of animal life. In 2003, the Kaurinukur project was rejected by the National Planning Agency on the basis of these ecological damages, but the Minister of the Environment overruled its decree. Even more though than the specific impacts of damming rivers and drilling boreholes, the way geothermal energy is produced, Icelandic environmentalists call into question the assumption of endless expansion these projects seem to make. Government and industry both like to claim that Iceland has more than enough energy to go around, citing at 30 terawatt hours as the island's annual hydropower capacity. But author and environmentalist Andres Magnusson, on researching this figure for his 2006 book Dreamland, discovered that this rate can only be achieved by damming every major river on the islands. Further developing energy resources then means making meaningful sacrifices in the name of economic growth. 
Furthermore, doing so links Iceland indelibly to the interests of international aluminum companies not known for their corporate social responsibility. The question then raised by Iceland's environmental activists is not does Iceland have enough energy for aluminum smelting, but rather is aluminum smelting worth sacrificing whichever pieces of the Icelandic environment it consumes. Today, these same questions are being asked of data storage, which is drawn to the energy machine that aluminum smelting made. In fact, when data centers first started cropping up on the island, the response I heard most often was they're better than smelters at least. That is, while data centers were power hungry, their perceptible externalities were few, especially compared with aluminum plants excretion of dangerous fluoride waste into the surrounding air and soils. In the years since, however, concerns have accumulated about the fundamentally extractive nature of the enterprise. So this is a segment of Kvalau, a beautiful and almost impossibly blue river that runs through Iceland's remote west fjords. It takes a boat and then a hike to get here, so few people actually see Kvalau up close. But soon that opportunity may be over, as Kvalau is slated for hydropower development. That project proposed by private energy company Hawas Orca would dam the river and direct the power it produces southward, specifically to the Reykjanes Peninsula, to feed the growing collection of data centers there. The Reykjanes, as I have already mentioned, benefits from a power plant developed in the service of an aluminum smelter and a cable built by the US military. Even this much energy is not sufficient for the collection of industries accumulating on the peninsula. The National Power Company has declared the situation a power shortage and advocated for further damming to address it. But environmentalists who vigorously oppose the plan at Kvalau have been pushing back against this frame. In a place where the needs of the domestic population are met and fivefold, a power shortage is perhaps not the right term. Instead, they suggest that Iceland is approaching the limit that energy companies and data centers like to deny. The point at which the production of hydropower will cost something more than the people are willing to pay. Arctera's advertisement may have boasted when you're backed by the planet, your potential is limitless, but Icelandic environmentalists are now drawing attention to the limits of what this part of the planet can provide. So this brief account of energy production in Iceland, like the whirlwind tour of the Nazcaf base before it, helps us to complicate the idea that the data storage industry finds its natural home in Iceland. Again, infrastructure is what enables data centers to make use of Iceland's abundant energy. But the story of that infrastructure is not straightforward. It is riddled with the influence of foreign corporations, rife with ethical and environmental questions. With the damming of the Kvalau River on the line now, data storage in Iceland appears not only not natural, but fundamentally at odds with nature here. If industry imagery suggests a seamless fit between data and nature, close attention to the energy systems that support that data shows how much slips through the cracks. Situated materialities. So I started this talk by laying out the association that many make between data and nature in Iceland. Then I proceeded to complicate this equation through ethnographic and historical attention to the infrastructures that support data storage on the island today. I wanna close by just reflecting a bit more broadly on what we learn from this kind of intervention. And I'm conceptualizing this as data's situated materialities. Now I am far from the first person to direct my attention to the physicality of digital data. Media scholars in particular have long been reminding us that the internet is not some ephemeral elsewhere, but is fundamentally comprised of physical things. Routers, servers, screens, cables, all this stuff undergirds our online experiences. The bulk of the materialist critique of IT though, has focused on digital data's environmental impacts. This important scholarship has helped us to calculate data centers annual energy consumption, track their water usage and estimate their carbon footprint. This work has placed the proliferation of digital data squarely within the crisis of anthropogenic climate change. But I'm suggesting here that materiality, materiality on its own does not go far enough 
without sustained attention to the politics of place. Conceiving of data storage as an environmental problem with environment standing in for something we all share equally gets us as far as invest in Iceland, Landsvirkjun and Arcteras attempts to claim Iceland as digital data's natural home. Data centers require cooling, but in Iceland they need less of it. Data centers consume power, but in Iceland it's clean and green. As we've seen, however, this neat solution it gets complicated when we zoom in on the actual on the ground processes of making and maintaining data centers here. If we shift scales from the general to the particular, right, this cable, that river, that road, we see that the infrastructure that converts Iceland's landforms and earth processes into consumable resources is itself the product of contentious and inequitable histories, specifically American military occupation and international corporate extractivism. These two project, projects have remade and made available Iceland's env environments in ways the data storage industry benefits from today. Furthermore, the new industry threatens to entrench that legacy, as the projected damming of Kvalau suggests. These local entanglements, these situated materialities, are obscured in convincing discourses that claim that data simply needs to find its proper home. Iceland is positioned as an escape in these projects, offering a supportive climate for data centers without cost. The narrative work of making this equation mobilizes nature every bit as effectively as a dam or wind turbine. But ethnographic attention to the ways that data gets placed can help us see past the so-called pure power of nature to the ways that power, electrical and otherwise, have been infrastructured or organized in durably inequitable ways. And these conversations are only going to grow more important as our digital data continues to proliferate. To go back to that World Hosting Days conference that I started with, one of that year's featured speakers strutted onto the main stage making the following promise. Quote, there's one topic that I promise you won't hear anyone talk about over the next couple days at this conference, and that is to compute less. Cisco is not going to talk to you about their slower networks or HP about reducing their capacity and compute, right? Data is growing and it's growing exponentially, end quote. When he said this, the room of who's who of the cloud services industry erupted into a raucous applause. There's lots of money and indeed plenty of useful products and services to be made in data storage and processing. But when we view data in terms of its situated materialities, we can read the trade-offs inherent in these claims. Where our data goes matters, not only for tech companies, but also for fishing towns, glacial rivers, and the mating grounds of migratory birds. As we make more of it, reckoning not only with the what of our data, its quantities and contents, but the where of it will become a collective responsibility. Tracing the infrastructures, inheritances and impacts of digital data in Iceland is one way of bringing into view the stakes of this work and of bringing the cloud back down to earth. Thank you. Um, I'll stop there and I'll just leave this up for a moment with my contact information um, and some places that you can read more. Thank you so much for that, Alex. That was really um a very compelling overview of the complexity and the breadth and the historical depth of these processes of situating new industries and in these particular kinds of edge spaces. And we know that islands often attract kind of novel forms of investment and are in some ways particularly available for um, some of these experiments, whether it's experiments in corporate structure or even experiments in kind of making new technologies. And you've shown very well um, these technologies, the ways in which they harness nature and even work against nature. So I really appreciate um, the sense of the kind of layers from the, the geology of Iceland to the layers of uh, military infrastructure, and then you know how the cloud kind of lands and um, kind of takes root um, within those locations. Uh, 
I want to just alert the attendees and the participants about the Q&A function. Um, so we already have one question coming up here. It's actually four questions. So let me read that and um, you'll be able to respond. Um, can the data centers really coexist without a cost to the environment and with a benefit to the local community? So what's your opinion on that? Um, and the US has twice as many data centers than the EU. How can European policies and activists keep the data center sustainable in a way that's different from the US? So let's start with those two questions and then we can move on to the rest. Sure, um, thank you for the questions. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the, um, you're pulling out some of the threads that I was getting at in that talk, Brenda. Um, so, okay, can data centers really exist without a cost to environment and benefiting local communities? Um, they don't, they don't anywhere that I know of. Um, in terms of can they, I mean, I'm sort of, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question, right? Because I think anything, can be made to exist that way, but is it going to be? And are we doing the work of compelling it to, right? So um, there are really interesting experiments in building data centers that, for example, use the heat that is produced um, by the servers to uh, provide heating to the surrounding town, right? That's an example of kind of a technological innovation that can um, make use of this industry that's already there and be of a very concrete service to a local community. Those experiments are not without their own problems and their own detractors. You can see uh, Julia Velkova's work um, explores that in detail. And also, they're very, very few and far between, right? The vast majority of these things are not even thinking about impact on the local community um, and at most thinking superficially about impact on the environment. And so can data centers do this? I think certainly they could. Um, I think the sort of more pressing question is, are we going to insist that they do? Um, the second question here, okay, the US has more data centers than the EU, how uh, European policies and activist efforts to keep data centers sustainable are different than in the US? Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good question. And I'll say upfront that I am not at all an expert in EU regulation, which is its own field. Um, what I can say is that um, environmental restrictions are much, much tighter in Europe than in the US, right? Um, so a lot more of this stuff gets caught at the layer of, of regulation restriction in Europe, um, whereas a lot more in the US really falls on the backs of grassroots activists. So Mel Hogan is someone who's written a lot about environmental activism in Utah around the water consumption of the NSA data center. Um, so much going on in that space. Um, but I would say that Europe in general has stronger environmental protections that do kind of capture a lot of these uh, energy intensive industries. Although again, I will say aluminum smelting in Iceland is 30% of the country's exports and 80% of the country's energy. So clearly those regulations on their own um, are not uh, are not kind of adequately intervening in a lot of these processes. We have um, some further questions, um, but I, I want to go to the next set of questions um, regarding the physicality of digital data. Um, and does Iceland's active volcanism pose any sort of threat to the continued development of these server farms? Mm -hmm. And there's a second question there about the geopolitical consequences of concentrating data centers in this node pole in terms of defense and security and protection. Sure, great questions. Um, does Iceland's volcanism pose any sort of threat to the continued development of server farms in Iceland? So I'm, I'm living in Iceland this year. Um, I'm currently on leave and I'm back in Iceland writing and doing research. And um, pretty much the week after I got back here, um, a, a, like over 5,000 earthquakes a day started happening. Like the ground started shaking and just did not stop for, <laughs> for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then after about three weeks, a uh, giant eruption started and has been flowing lava for you know eight months since. You might have seen this on the news. It's really cool. It's very beautiful. Um, so volcanism is a regular routine feature of the landscape in Iceland. And it does come up in these conversations about developing digital infrastructure here. So more than once, 
in uh, kind of corporate events like the World Hosting Days Conference, I saw Icelanders or folks who were trying to attract data centers to Iceland make these very beautiful nature oriented pitches um, that kind of uh, work really hard to keep volcanoes out of the frame. And the first question is always like, oh, what about the volcanoes? Um, the, the fact about the volcanoes is that Icelanders know where they are and they've known for a really long time. And so they're, they're sighted really far away from settlements and infrastructure. The likelihood of a volcano actually causing problems for anything more than a few farms um, is very, very, very low. But what's interesting, I think, about that dynamic is the the kind of the other side of like making this pitch based on nature, right? Um, folks want to say that folks want to emphasize Iceland's wild and untamed environment and make this the centerpiece of their pitch. But the risk there is always that nature is wild and unpredictable, right? And that that kind of risk, um, especially with volcanoes, but also in regard to things like earthquakes. Um, to a lesser extent storms, that risk kind of creeps back into the frame. So I would say it's a, a not very likely to cause major problems, but a huge thing that my interlocutors still worry about. Um, in terms of geopolitical consequences of concentrating data centers in countries of the node pole, in terms of defense and protection of these valuable assets. Yeah, so I, I do a lot of work um, outside this talk on data center security, which is a a really um, wild and interesting field. These places, as you might have seen in that one picture of the data center with the security fence, um, are highly securitized environments. And it's no coincidence that that one was built on a military base, right? The secure perimeter, the safe distance from the population tells you um, that uh, protection is taken quite seriously here. All the same, um, let's see. <laughs> um, all the same, Iceland was the site of a really high profile server theft in 2017 and 2018, um, where millions of dollars worth of equipment were stolen right out of data centers here. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of reasons that happened. It was a very kind of compelling heist uh, that got a lot of coverage in the media, but it did prompt a kind of conversation about like, whoa, do we know where our data is going and do we know who's watching it and how many layers of security are between a guy with a crowbar and the server holding our stuff? Um, so I think it's a really active, open conversation. I can say that those kind of breaches are really rare. And since that happened, um, I'm told that security is tightened. But there's a little bit of a black box around data center security. Um, in that they don't want to share a lot of that information because they don't want to give you the information you need to get inside. Um, so I think, you know, the raising geopolitics here is, a, is an interesting kind of additional point. Um, it's another factor that shapes where our data flows and goes, right? In addition to these sort of environmental incentives, there's also conversations about, well, who's an ally or whose police force are we willing to trust? Or, you know, when it comes down to it, is this government going to let another government access my data? Those are all very, very active questions in the industry that are not definitively answered yet. I'm going to raise a clarifying question of my own. Does Iceland have a military? No. So Iceland um, is one of the only countries without any kind of standing army. What Iceland does have is a coast guard, but they are primarily responsible for search and rescue operations off the coast. However, um, because Iceland hosted the U.S. military base for over 50 years, um, the U.S. really, but more broadly, NATO continues to have a presence around the Icelandic airport. And so there will be kind of like patrols that fly through. NATO does exercises in Iceland, and sometimes the Icelandic Coast Guard will collaborate with that. But they don't have their own military. Okay, I want to go back to the questions of um, the first attendee, um, which gets to the geopolitical issues regarding if you have a server in Iceland in Europe, um, is that better than having it in the US or even China? So what does that say about Europe's competitiveness in the data race? Yeah, well, there's different ways of answering that question, right? Is it better to have it in Iceland versus the US versus China? There's a lot of kind of axes along which that better can fall. Um, one of the most important ways of thinking through this question is around kind of concepts of data sovereignty. So 
the advent of distributed or cloud computing raised all of these questions about sovereignty and jurisdiction, right? So if a piece of data exists, it was written by someone in the US, but it's stored on a server that exists in Iceland and it's published on a website that's hosted in the Netherlands, right? Who is responsible for that piece of data? Who do you go to to take it down? Who can be prosecuted for doing whatever kinds of things with it, right? I think this is kind of one of the major geopolitical questions that's come up in data storage. And Iceland, and this is a, another um, kind of a weird moment in data history that I've written about, um, Iceland for a while, as the data storage industry was developing, made a point of trying to exploit this kind of emerging geography by saying, okay, well, maybe we're going to pass a lot of legislation that makes Iceland a really safe place to store information, right? A place with really um, generous information freedom laws, a place that really resists things like censorship and prior restraint. And so in doing so, maybe we can create a jurisdiction whereby everybody, Americans, people all over the world might be incentivized to store their data in Iceland because it's going to be protected by that legislative regime. Um, um, this got as far as a parliamentary resolution in 2010. It got a ton of good press at the time, um, and it had a lot of political support. Ultimately, it has not quite happened for reasons that I think are pretty predictable, right? The question comes down to, at the end of the day, if the, if the American government wants access to an Icelandic server, is Iceland, which again does not have a military and has been a historic ally of the US, is Iceland going to say, no, go home? And I think what what journalists media activists and officials have kind of landed on is no it's not right so there's there's different ways to conceptualize this question of like is it better to have data here or there um security is one access is one environmental interest is another one um iceland has been playing on multiple fronts trying to make iceland a good place to store data um but nobody kind of has cornered the market on that yet we have one more question up here, which is really a question about the next phase. So if these data centers actually eventually move underwater, um, how do you imagine that these spaces and infrastructures might be repurposed? Yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a couple dynamics there that are kind of interesting. Like I mentioned in the talk, there's a lot of there's a lot of innovation going on in the data storage industry, right? People are always trying to make these things smaller, more power efficient, um, and sort of crucially less attached to local communities, which you can see is a good thing and a bad thing, right? Like companies want to um, not get taken to task for their impacts. And so they're kind of withdrawing themselves from that equation altogether by trying to shoot their data into space. Um, but the move toward underwater infrastructure is interesting because it would free up all of that space they take up on land, right? These things wouldn't be eyesores, they wouldn't be noise polluters, um, people, environmentalists might have less to complain about. But at the same time, and there's a really excellent article that's coming out in the next issue of New Media and Society called The Pacific Future of Data Centers, um, which makes very clear that moving data storage underwater does not eliminate the problem of infrastructure, right? So. Um, all of these like underwater cooling mechanisms, the releasing of heat, all of these things have impacts on marine environments, which we're sort of very liable to ignore while we're on land. Um, and also, depending on where these things are put, they're not necessarily less socially impactful off land. So this uh, forthcoming article, um, and I was a reviewer, so I don't know the author's name, but it's coming out in the next issue. Um, goes into the development of offshore data centers in Hawaii and talks about how for indigenous Hawaiians, the ocean is every bit as much a part of the environment, as much a part of sociality and politics as land, right? And so moving these things literally offshore is conceptualized as a way to kind of divorce them from the political and social problems in which they're currently very deeply enmeshed. Um, but I think for both infrastructural and also kind of socio-political reasons, that won't necessarily be the case. We have about five minutes left. Are there any more questions from the audience? I'll ask a question if, if no one else has one. I know, uh, Alex, that the, the EU is not your particular area of expertise. And uh, I know that Iceland has a, a somewhat unique relationship, having been the only one to leave officially, well, to end their negotiations. Um, 
And I, I'm just wondering if there is any engagement uh, with the rest of Europe or with the EU per se in the development of this node or in the development of this um, technology and integration of data storage into the, the environmental space. Yes. Um, yeah, let's see. There, there is in the sense that this is, it's a, a shared conversation that's nevertheless marked by competition. And so there are, you know, European specific conferences, collaborations, grant funding that go into this kind of development. Um, and also, and this is both, um, I think, kind of a natural product of this stuff being a, a marketplace and also Iceland's specific history of kind of otherness and exceptionalism. Um, Iceland is always trying to distinguish themselves from those places, right? So um, the, the island thing, Iceland is always uh, trying to sell. The environmental, um, the green energy production is what really distinguishes Iceland. And so there are definitely points of collaboration um, and there is a kind of Europe-wide conversation, but I would say that Iceland and very very characteristically, given its history, um, distinguishes, distinguishes itself from that kind of pack. Um, and security is actually one of the fields um, that differentiates them. So when I was at that World Hosting Days conference, for example, I spent uh, multiple hours listening to the Luxembourg people telling me about how safe their data centers were. Um, and over at the Iceland booth, they make jokes about like, why do we don't need to worry about security? We're a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. What we can offer you is cheap power, right? So um, there, it, there are sites of European collaboration, but I think this is also one of many places where um, distinction within the EU and even within the Nordic kind of family comes into play. Well, thank you so much for your talk and I thank the audience for their questions. We look forward to seeing where your research goes, Alex, and to your forthcoming book. Thank you all so much for having me. It's been great. Thank you very much, Alex. And thanks to our audience members and to Brenda for agreeing to moderate this. I hope everyone has a lovely day and enjoy Iceland. Enjoy the snow that apparently you are uh, receiving. <laughs> Thank you. I'll try.